welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. We have a very exciting um, uh, program for you. Uh, you are here with the Association for Leadership in Science, Science and Nursing. Uh, we're an international association dedicated to uniting academic practice leaders to shape the science and education in nursing. Today's seminar is Leadership Strategies for Pandemic Management and Long-Term Care. We have Dr. Maura McPhee, and Dr. McPhee is um, a health services researcher who studies nurses work environments. She has expertise in healthcare leadership development. She co-developed a residential leadership training institute for nurse leaders in the province of British Columbia. And she has adapted this leadership model to leadership development in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Brazil. She is a member of the Canadian Association of Schools of Nursing work group, currently examining graduate level nursing leadership preparation. Research-wise, she has been studying care delivery models and workload management assessment tools to inform safe staffing, uh, like skill mix, staffing levels, and layout. She has conducted care delivery research in acute care, ambulatory care, and specialty care settings, and most recently, the long-term care sector. She uses mixed methods methodology to study healthcare delivery systems, including realist methods. We also have Dr. Farinaz Hawaii is a health service researcher interested in studying the work environment factors that facilitate or hinder, nurse, hinder nurses' ability to deliver quality and safe patient care across the healthcare spectrum. Funded by Michael Smith Foundation Health Research and Canadian Institute of Health Research, Dr. Hawaii's research recently shifted from long-term sector where she has been evaluating the intended and unintended consequences of pandemic management policies, visitation restriction and single site employment orders on nurses and their care provision to the residents and their families. Dr. Hawaii holds her MSFHR Scholar Award from 2021 to 2026, focused on promoting workplace psychological health and safety in the nursing workforce and long-term care. Dr. Hawaii is a mixed method researcher and psychometric expert. And then there we have no conflicts of interest uh, for this session. And just as a reminder for our CEs, it's been approved by the California Board of Registered Nursing. Licensees must retain this for four years and all participants will receive their certificate of attendance after completion of this survey. Okay, and so now I'm going to stop sharing and let's see, sorry many things open here. While she does that, I'm just going to jump in real quick. The survey link is not active anymore. We'll email you a link to the survey when the session is, when the webinar is complete. Thank you. Okay, I will turn it over to Dr. Hawaii and Dr. McPhee. Thanks for the introduction, Colleen. I don't know if you guys are able to share my screen. We can see it, thank you. Okay, and Maura, you should have control of the slides now. Great, thank you. Well, uh, hello everybody. Um, I don't know all the time zones you're coming from. Uh, it's about nine in the morning in Vancouver, BC, and uh, we're delighted to join you today. Uh, thank you for the great introduction, Colleen. So uh, Naz and I uh, study health services environments. And uh, one of the things that we're really interested in is magnet-like characteristics. And that's something that I know is familiar to everyone. And uh, so we've, we've studied all of the different magnet-like factors that can affect acute care. And now we're kind of moving into the long-term care sector. We started this work in long-term care about 2018. And as you all know, with, with magnet and with magnet-like environments, leadership and effective leadership at all levels is one of those key criteria. And so we have been looking at leadership in long-term care to see how leadership strategies made a difference to pandemic management. And so we're going to share our research with you and hopefully leave some time so that you, if you have questions, we can have some dialogue. And I'm trying, oh, oh, I'm trying let to. Me, let me get, get the control back for a sec, Maura. Okay. I can 
I don't know why this happened. Um, uh oh. There we go. You know okay. what? Let, let me, if that's okay, let me just uh, maybe. Oh, you advance it. Okay. Yeah. Because the, the, yeah. There you go. Always technology. So uh, in Canada, we do land acknowledgements. And so uh, as part of our truth and reconciliation with Indigenous nations in Canada. And so Naz and I would like to acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples. And that's the Squamish, Dolo, Salitooth, and Musqueam nations. And uh, that link there, uh, which will be available to people, shows all of the beautiful Indigenous art that we have around our campus in Vancouver, British Columbia. So as I mentioned, Naz and I started doing work looking at uh, nurses' work environments around 2018. And we actually were asked by our Provincial Nurses Union to do a survey of all of their members, which is about 47,000 nurses in BC. And uh, RN Forecast is a proprietary name for Linda Aiken and her colleagues' research program, but the assessment tools they use are actually in the public domain and any researcher can use them. They just can't call them RN Forecast. So Naz and I used the same assessment tools that have been used in RN Forecast research. And we gave it to uh, the BC Nurses Union. We got about a 10% response response rate. And we checked to see that um, the, uh, the demographics of our sample population were similar to the whole nursing population. And they were, they were representative. So we've been analyzing that data. And one of the things we found pre-pandemic is that uh, in terms of workload, the long-term care sector had the greatest workload issues. And a typical uh, ratio for nurses, RNs, was 44 residents to one nurse. We looked at how that affected their capacity to do essential tasks. And you can see in terms of order there that uh, we became very concerned when we noticed that resident surveillance, about half the nurses weren't able to do that during their shift. And resident surveillance is linked to failure to rescue. It's linked to morbidity and mortality rates. So that was very concerning. But another thing that we realized is that if you look at the last one, comfort and emotional support, almost 80% of nurses were unable to do that during their shift. And of course, that's very important in patient care and certainly in resident care within their home environments. Next slide, please. We also looked at uh, nurse outcomes pre-pandemic using those uh, assessment tools. And in long-term care, the nurses had the worst outcomes in terms of burnout, post-traumatic stress disorder, sleep disturbances, and emotional and physical abuse from residents and families. So we decided that we were going to drill down more um, looking at what goes on within long-term care. And we decided to work with a gold standard long-term care facility in Vancouver. In Canada, uh, every uh, healthcare organization has to go through basic quality safety accreditation, but there are also voluntary accreditation programs. And in long-term care, it's, uh, it's a very rigorous evaluation to see whether uh, the standards go above and beyond just those basic quality safety parameters. It's actually looking for magnet-like characteristics. And so we partnered with Louis Breyer, and you can kind of see base, the very uh, the banners there in the picture down below. And that's really kind of their gold seal of approval. And they've had that type of accreditation consistently for several years. Louis Breyer uh, is a Jewish, is affiliated with the Jewish community in Vancouver, but it has all denominations uh, that of, of residents who live there. It has a, a pretty similar makeup to most other long-term care facilities in BC. We're about 
15% of their direct care staff are RNs and LPNs and 60% are personal support workers or care aides. And there are 200 seniors who live in this, this long-term care home. They really vary on that continuum of physical frailty and 80% of them are diagnosed with dementia. So we started working with them. And one of the things that was really exciting is we got some money to look at innovation. How can we bring innovation into long-term care? And so pre-pandemic, we started to work on developing a resident assessment tool to look specifically at ways to rate in real time the acuity and dependency of each of the residents. And with our graduate and doctoral students, we were starting to do uh, work on end of life care education for all staff and also looking at ways to enhance dementia care to make it more evidence-based. And then the pandemic hit and that changed everything. And uh, you may know from the news that in Canada, long-term care was really hard hit. And so the 81% uh, of mortalities from COVID-19 in Canada were in long-term care. And senior mortality in long-term care was 13 times higher than seniors living in the community. In addition of all COVID cases, 10% were long-term care staff. So it was this double whammy of residents as well as long-term care staff. In our province, there were uh, outbreaks in 23 facilities and Louis Breyer remained COVID free. So we talked with them about coming in and doing work with them and we got funding to uh, do a case study during the pandemic to find out what were they doing. And uh, I just, we put on this slide, why long-term care has been such a problem uh, in our province. And it's just because there's such high density between residents and staff. There was a lot of communal space. It was really hard to shift that around and heavy, heavy workloads. And this is some research we put in here. This is what NAS did. So uh, one of the things that NAS did is to repeat the surveys that we'd done pre-pandemic. And with the support of the union, uh, the survey was repeated right at the beginning of the pandemic at time two, and then later on time three. And one of the interesting things that we saw across all sectors was a spike right at the beginning in terms of nurses, anxiety and depression, and then kind of a smoothing out over time, which is good. Um, but there was this immediate spike and it was the highest in long-term care where 61% uh, of nurses reported increases in anxiety and 35% uh, an increase in depression. So when we talked with Louis Breyer to find out what they were doing, uh, one of the things that we used is a BC Center for D Disease Control framework. And uh, we have a federal and also we have provincial centers for disease control that work with our public health departments. And so all of the healthcare facilities in BC were asked to follow this disease control framework at the start of COVID. And so uh, NAS converted the framework into a checklist. We gave it to the leadership team and we asked them uh, the questions that uh, you see below. So we asked them to look at uh, the checklist indicate if they were doing those things or if they weren't able to do them. There are indicators for the checklist, which I'll show you in a minute. And then we did interviews where we asked them very specific questions to kind of drill down to find out if they thought uh, which items were essential, which ones weren't, what were barriers, what were facilitators for them to carry out all of these infection control measures. So this is uh, an example of some of the practices on the BC CDC checklist. And for monitoring, uh, two key indicators were uh, maintaining personal protective uh, uh, equipment, stock, and also adequate staffing levels. Now, if it's in black, it means that Louis Breyer was able to do it. If it's in red, it means that they weren't able to do it. And they essentially said that all of the items on the checklist were important to them. 
So under communication, they were able to get a response team set up with uh, clear communication. NAS is gonna go into these examples in a little bit more detail. One thing that they didn't have was a response plan. In terms of screening, uh, they kept a very up-to-date contact list to make sure people entering the facility were accounted for and could be tracked. And they also had a sick policy to encourage staff to stay home if they were sick. Staff were also trained to use all of the PPE equipment. And one of the other things that was unique to long-term care in British Columbia is that although all the other healthcare sectors were required to wear N95 masks and do N95 mask, mask fit testing, this was not true for the long-term sector. The government basically said, you don't need to do it in long-term care. Ironically, Louis Breyer was ready to go, but then they didn't have the support of the province. In terms of source control, uh, it's very unusual for long-term care facilities in Canada to have single rooms with private toilets. And Louis Breyer tried to do what they could do to partition and keep people safe, but uh, they, they do have people who share bathrooms and rooms. And then the other one that was very important on the checklist is psychological supports for staff, especially in terms of their well being, but also for residents. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Naz now, who's going to go into more detail about the interview findings. Thanks, Maura. So our in depth interviews with the executive leadership team at Louis Breyer um, Home and Hospital. Um, was essentially a way for us to find out, you know, what were those main challenges that leadership encountered during the pandemic and how they went about resolving those challenges and addressing them. One of the most important challenges that the leadership team essentially experienced was an increasing need for leadership communication with the staff at a time of great uncertainty, especially when some of the non-direct uh, care team members, you know, such as accounting, finance, were essentially asked to um, stay home and work virtually. And so to address this, this need for uh, leadership communication, the leadership team essentially provided all employees working from home access to laptops. And employees working from home were also given a virtual private network with greater bandwidth to support quick and effective communication, um, not, not only with the leadership team, but also among uh, with, with their team members and among their team. The leadership team also started a WhatsApp group to maintain informal contact with their teams, especially you know, th those uh, staff members who were sort of working from home and working virtually. And so these were some of the strategies that sort of helped leadership team stay in touch with their staff and maintain regular communication at, at the time of a crisis. One of the other main sources of concern for the executive leadership team at Louis Breyer was the strict visitation policy that was essentially introduced across all long-term care homes in BC. It was a mandated policy that essentially prevented families and visitors from coming to long-term care homes unless in life-threatening life situations such as end of life. And so this policy created significant challenges for the leadership team and also for the staff who now had to fill in family members' shoes, ensuring that the day-to-day -day needs of residents were being met, needs that were previously being met by family members and informal caregivers who were coming to the facility to spend time with their, with their loved ones particularly in relation to meeting their psychosocial um, care needs. And so to overcome this, this challenge, the recreational department at Louis Breyer essentially enabled virtual communication between residents and families. They also created a virtual mailbox letter for letter exchange between residents and relatives. And finally, staff um, 
also really played a big role in all of this and really stepped up their care. Some of them uh, coming to work on their own time without any compensation, just to spend time with, with the residents and who, you know, they did not have a lot of social contact during the height of the pandemic when the policy was introduced to essentially ensure that they do not feel lonely, lonely and, and isolated in, in the absence of their loved ones. And so because families were not um, able to come into the care home, there was an increasing need for communication and updates to residents and families because prior to the pandemic, families were coming to the care home and were receiving updates and information from the staff on site, but they sort of lo lost that ability once, once the policy, the strict visitation policy was, was put in place. And so staff really stepped it up again and became the eyes and ears of loved ones, ensuring that important information about individual residents was being promptly communicated to their loved ones, to their loved ones and relatives outside of the care home. And the leadership team actually um, identified this, this whole increasing demand for communication with families and, and residents as a very labor intensive uh, process, but also noted that it, it was extremely valuable. It was extremely necessary to get residents, families and staff going at the time of the COVID pandemic then, and especially during the height of the pandemic early on. One of the other challenges was that, as Maura pointed out, um, you know, in, in our study, and as we also sort of um, found in, in this case study with Louis Breyer, was a great level of worry and anxiety among um, long-term care uh, staff. You know, a lot of the staff, our, our survey results showed that they were extremely concerned about exposure to COVID-19 and spreading it to their loved ones at home or even bringing uh, the virus to the facility and spreading it among residents. And so one of the ways that leadership uh, team tried to alleviate staff anxiety and worry was increasing their physical presence on the unit, doing walkabouts, holding regular Q&A huddles with the staff, and sending out frequent communications and updates and really paying attention to the content of, of those updates and making sure that the messaging was simple, succinct, and, and very clear. Um, one of the other strategies that the leadership team used to sort of try to alleviate staff anxiety was, was this mandated policy to screen all visitors for COVID-19 at the front entry and, and taking um, visitors temperature before, before entry. And they actually noticed that this policy, the COVID screening policy was, was really a helpful intervention and a helpful strategy for um, alleviating staff anxiety. And finally, there, there was obviously the health authority rapid response team that was available 24 seven for any urgent and emergent situations and or questions that um, the staff or the leadership team had in relation to um, COVID-19 or, or keeping um, the facility safe. One of the other significant challenges was communication from the higher up organizations like the Ministry of Health and, and how they communicated to uh, Louis Breyer and other care homes uh, in the province. And I, I think this was one of the probably most significant challenges that, that the leadership team essentially pointed out. And they described the communication was often delayed and, and sometimes even inconsistent and conflicting. One leader talked about how the communication about the single site policy. So the single site policy was the policy that essentially prohibited staff uh, from um, employment from multi, like from multi-site employment to essentially slow the spread of the virus. And so they felt that communication about this policy was confusing in terms of you know, what was expected of care homes to accomplish uh, uh, policy implementation. So they were just notified about, you know, by this date, you need to be implementing the policy. This is, the, this is what the policy 
uh, sort of mandates you to do, but there wasn't really much about how they should go about policy implementation and what might be some of the barriers and facilitators that care homes uh, sort of would encounter in terms of policy implementation. Another example was, you know, with respect to personal protective equipment, one leader no noted how the communication from the higher up organizations as sort of did not give them much lead time to prepare for orders coming out and sometimes information was again, conflicting. So when um, PPE was mandated, again, the uh, care home leadership, the Louis Breyer leadership felt that they did not have enough time to essentially prepare and plan for the mandated use of personal protective equipment. And then also changes in relation to the visitation policy were communicated to care homes at the same time as they were shared with the public, creating significant challenges for the care homes in relation to effectively planning and responding to families' needs for visits. Because at uh, some point during the pandemic, the visitation um, restriction was sort of relaxed slightly, but those changes were sort of communicated to Louis Breyer um, not, not so promptly and not certainly not in advance of communication to the public and that created challenges. Um, the pandemic, um, even though it, it created some of these challenges that I just uh, um, sort of uh, uh, went over, it also resulted in some uh, success stories for Louis Breyer. First of all, early in the pandemic, um, they, they were able to change their, their system to a paperless electronic system that was a lot more effective and efficient for managing contracts. And there are a couple of quotes from one leader speaking to how the electronic system um, you know, has been really beneficial to the facility that it enabled them to track everything they were doing, everything that they were using so that, you know, they knew exactly how much everything would cost them and therefore they would be able to um, sort of plan for, for the pandemic or throughout the pandemic more effectively. Um, so there was also a sort of just statements about, um, you know, just uh, the, the care home being able to use a more effective and efficient electronic documentation system. And so that was another success story of Louis Breyer leadership during the pandemic. And then finally, during the pandemic, Louis Breyer leadership uh, sort of spoke about how they were able to still uh, despite everything that was happening and despite of all the stressors in, in um, terms of sort of um, health and safety and long term care, they were able to create a sense of community among their staff and essentially encourage staff to have fun and still have a positive spirit. So they talked about during Nurses Week how they sort of did TikTok appreciation videos. They also talked about what was really interesting. They acknowledged the really important role that the public played in, played in terms of sort of helping to keep the spirit of the staff uh, up. And there, there's a quote here about you know, how the facility received lots of donations and lots of recognition from the public. And that, that was a really helpful strategy for um, essentially creating a sense of community among the staff at Louis Breyer. So I'm gonna just pause here and hand it over to Maura to just sort of provide a quick um, summary of some of our key learnings from this study. Maura? You're on mute. There, sorry. Uh, so one, one of the things that was very interesting is that um, social media really helped. So the leaders uh, had all been through the SARS uh, epidemic that happened in, well, it was an endemic that happened in Toronto. And they, they actually, most of the staff from Louis Breyer, the leadership team, uh, had experiences with SARS, with H1N1. And so uh, when we asked them, well, how did you, how did you know what was going to happen? They said that they were following social media. And that as soon as there was mention of an outbreak in China, 
they started to think, what might we have to do? And so they put their own essential services plan together and started to be proactive about looking at material and human resources to be sure they were ready. And they were, they were right on top of things, as were other uh, long-term care facilities and even acute care facilities were floundering. And uh, there wasn't an essential plan for what to do about infection control management in a crisis. Uh, there was no provincial plan, so uh, it was really good that they had their own. Uh, in addition, as, as Naz mentioned, is using their... Um, their electronic system, documentation system to track everything and to be there present, providing continuous safety education and training updates. It's not a one-time thing. Uh, and they put safety first. So uh, the, the CEO told us, you know, it's always safety first. And if it's going to cost us money, that's fine. We'll deal with it later. And then uh, it was very important to figure out from all the messaging, all the policy changes going on, what's critical information? What do we have to share? So that it wasn't this barrage of information going out that was confusing. The uh, leadership really chunked it and sent it out in timely fashion as needed. There was uh, a lot of great coordination and decision-making going on with key stakeholders. So someone from Louis Breyer was in communication with all of those key stakeholders. Canada is very unionized, so it was really important to keep in touch with all the unions. And then, uh, especially in terms of things like change in, uh, in, in in, in employment, like to that one site policy that had to be worked out with the unions. So very complex in terms of how quickly all of these key stakeholders had to be managed. Uh, and then of course the technology, uh, it's a very technology savvy low, uh, uh, long term care home and that's helped them tremendously. And they're always there with their staff, the leadership team, giving that consistent psychosocial uh, support. And um, this was a big message that we put in bold. This is the time to do things better. Do we have the right care delivery design and staffing to care for our increasingly fragile population? So um, Naz, did you wanna do these or? I thought you were. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> so um, this one policy that Naz mentioned is the single site policy. And one of the reasons why this uh, created problems is that a lot of long-term care, uh, care aides, personal support workers are what we call precarious employment because they do work casual in many sites. And that's just so that they can make enough money because many times if they are casual or even part-time, they don't have any benefits. And uh, so when the single site policy came out, the province and all of the other long-term care facilities had no accurate list of who was working where. So it was this immediate scramble to figure out where employees were going to work. And they had to make a decision. Are we going to work at Louis Breyer full time or are we going to work someplace else? So it totally changed the whole work schedule and workflow, especially for personal support workers. So March was a real month of chaos. Uh, absentee hours, overtime hours were high because of that policy. But again, it started to smooth out and that, that very high peak of mental health with anxiety, depression, which was true for the leadership team as well, that kind of smoothed out. And now they're using their electronic system so that they can better track what's going on, especially so that they, they can be sure that they're compensating people. So one of, just to build, build up on what Maura said, one of the things that happened after our study or in the midst of our study with Louis Breyer, was because the single site policy uh, created significant challenges as, as per evidence from our study with Louis Breyer, we actually received uh, some additional funding to essentially evaluate the impact of the policy among four care homes in, in British Columbia, Canada, 
uh, one of them being Louis Breyer Home and Hospital. And so as part of um, that study, we um, looked at administrative data, particularly in relation to staffing indicators. So things like overtime turnover, vacancy rates, so on and so forth. And so I'm just gonna sort of share a couple of um, examples with you based on the data that we sort of analyze as part of that uh, second study or follow-up study. So we looked at administrative data on direct nursing staff rate of overtime for four quarters before and four quarters during the pandemic because our results from the case study with Louis Breyer had suggested that, you know, to sort of compensate or overcome some of the staffing challenges caused by the single site policy that the leadership team was heavily relying on use of overtime to essentially meet the needs of residents. And so in that study, nursing staff essentially included registered nurses, licensed practical nurses and personal support workers or care aides. And so what you're seeing here on, on the left hand side top graph, the overall trend for the direct care nursing staff showed increases in overtime rate throughout our data collection period with a faster rate of increase for during uh, the pandemic quarters compared to pre-pandemic. So looking at the trend slope, you, you can see that before the pandemic, our trend slope was 0.33, and during the uh, pandemic quarters, the tre trend slope increased to 0.43. So essentially, the overtime increased um, by 0.33% for every quarter pre-pandemic, and then during COVID, the overtime uh, rate increased faster than the pre-pandemic trend with the over overtime rate increasing by 0.43% every quarter. So this was sort of consistent with some of the anecdotal evidence that we were hearing from Louis Breyer leadership and leadership um, team from the other three um, uh, partner care homes. We also conducted cost designation analysis, looking at RNs, LPNs, and care aids um, separately to see if they were the impact was similar or different among different nursing designations. And we actually found that different nurse designations were impacted differently. The rate of increase in overtime rate steepened during COVID-19 for RNs and care rates, but the trend for LPNs showed a decreasing trend of overtime rate. And so essentially just again, looking at the trend slope, you can see for RNs, it, it increases to 1.45 from 0.48, so almost a, a threefold increase during the pandemic. For care rates, it's almost a twofold um, um, increase for care rates during the pandemic. But surprisingly, for licensed practical nurses, we're seeing a decreasing or a declining trend during the pandemic. In relation to turnover, we uh, found that the pre-pandemic rate increased by 50.59% um, every quarter for total direct nursing care staff. Uh, but during the pandemic, the turnover rate remained relatively stable over time. So the trend slope is negative 0.08. It's a very um, close number to zero. So suggesting that the rate is relatively stable. But cross designation analysis showed that for RNs and LPNs, the turnover rate increased faster during the pandemic than pre-pandemic. But for care rates, the rate actually increased pre-pandemic, but decreased during the pandemic. So again, um, some, some uh, increasing numbers and trend slopes for RNs and also for LPNs, but for care rates, the positive direction on during uh, pre-pandemic changes to a negative direction, a declining trend during the pandemic. And so I think this finding essentially supports how RNs and LPNs often have greater employment opportunities than personal support workers or unregulated uh, care aides who had no choice but to continue to work in the long-term care sector during the pandemic. Maura? Thanks, Naz. 
So uh, we, we know that uh, we don't have a lot of time left, but we thought we would share with you what's happening now, what we're working on now with Louis Breyer, because now that things have smoothed out and we have a loosening of COVID restrictions, we've gone back to looking at care delivery redesign for their facility, which was one of their innovation wish lists. And so um, we agreed to work on uh, care delivery redesign using the Synergy model. And uh, for those of you in the US, you may have heard of this. It was originally developed in the 1990s by the American Association of Critical Care Nurses. And there is a textbook on the Synergy model and how it's been implemented throughout the US that was published, I think the first edition uh, or second edition came out in 2007. It was published by Sigma Theta Tau International. But the editor and my mentor at Boston Children's Hospital at that time was Martha Curley. And uh, I was professional practice director there at that time. And so I learned about the Synergy model and we used it extensively at Boston Children's. So the Synergy model has two parts. It has a patient characteristic needs assessment tool. And then there is also a nurse competencies tool that was developed by Pat Benner that goes from novice to expert. And the idea of the synergy model is to use the patient needs assessment tool, score your patients, and then make a determination of a fit with nurse competencies from novice to expert. And the uh, proposition or the, the model basically says, if you get a good fit between your patient needs and your nurse competencies, you get best possible outcomes or synergy. So uh, we, we uh, used it at Boston Children's, and I've uh, used it in several pilots that we've done up in Canada where we've introduced it as a way to improve care delivery. Now, the needs assessment tool that we're currently using with Louis Breyer has eight characteristics. And so after primary assessment, which is done by a nurse, um, the nurse scores each of those eight characteristics on a one to five scale. And I'll show that to you in a minute. But these uh, characteristics are divided into five acuity characteristics and three dependency characteristics. And even though there are these basic definitions, this is a very nurse-driven model because expert nurses will have to identify what assessment indicators they use to determine if a patient is a low, moderate, or high acuity, a low, moderate dependency for each of those characteristics. Once nurses get really comfortable with doing this, they can do it very quickly. Um, just you know, even a few minutes to do it. So um, we've, we've used it now in many provinces across Canada, but we've never used it with residential care. So we're doing this the first time with Louis Breyer. And next slide, Naz. So this is just an example. I know it's hard to see, but this is just an example of assessment indicators that Louis Breyer identified for scoring their residents. You'll see the eight characteristics across the top. And then uh, the five indicates highest need. So one and twos are lowest needs, threes are moderate needs, and four fives are high needs. And each one of these has to be scored for a resident to give a holistic picture of their acuity dependency needs. One of the things about the synergy model and, or this approach is that it's a resident centered. It is nurse driven because the nurses basically identify the scoring indicators they're gonna use. They refine and validate the tool. Um, and it, this usually takes about three or four months using the train the trainer approach to teach everybody to do it. So we did this at Louis Breyer and we had uh, family and resident representatives. We had uh, all direct care staff there, including care aides who participated. And this is just an example of the rating sheet that they use. And uh, this is also something that can be added to their point click care electronic documentation system. 
so this is just some preliminary work that Naz has been doing because she's the quantitative person. And uh, we, we looked at the hospital, HWN is where you have higher acuity residents, they're in a hospital environment. And then HE stands for the home care side where it's more basic and they're, uh, they're, they're not as acute. So this is just uh, preliminary, but scoring uh, of doing the synergy scores over these different time periods for about a week at a time, you'll see that for the hospital, there's just a very lot of variability, but definitely higher needs than what you see down at the care home level, where it's fairly stable. So once using these synergy scores, we're going to drill down a bit more to see how these synergy scores can help them come up with a care delivery model where they have a better idea of the skill mix and the staffing levels that they're going to need. So I think that's our last slide. And then just to see if you have any questions for us. Thank you, Dr. McPhee and Dr. Hawaii. Uh, we did have a couple of questions. I think the first one that Laura had asked was the restriction of visitation. And um, uh, you did mention that it was restricted at one point and then opened back up. Um, and then there was the, the communication, which I think you answered as well, by getting it back to the bedside since things were so rapidly changing with the L LPNs, the nursing and the um, care assistants. Did the leadership team utilize the, um, the huddles you said? Was there anything else? Did they use, use WhatsApp for those team members or only for um, those working at home? Maura, do you want to answer or do you want me to? You, you go ahead, Ness. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so they, um, WhatsApp communication was mostly for informal communication with those staff members who were working virtually. And then in terms of the staff that were coming to the facility, again, the leadership team really increased their presence and doing walkabouts on the units, uh, holding Q&A huddles and sort of just keeping communication that way. One of the other points that uh, essentially the leadership team uh, pointed out was that they used multiple modes of communication to make sure that communication and updates were being sort of conveyed and transferred to staff members using you know, the bulletin board, using email, using um, the WhatsApp app, lots of modes of communication in order to ensure that um, the staff had the required information to be um, sort of just alleviating anxiety and stress for them. Perfect, thank you. And then Betsy asked how many LPNs versus RNs were on for each shift? Uh, so it really, I think, varies unit to unit, but based on some of the research that we did um, before, as Maura pointed out in one of those earlier slides, our province-wide uh, survey of nurses showed that in long-term care sector, for uh, every registered nurse or every licensed practical nurse was assigned to about 40, 40 residents, 40 or more residents on average. Gotcha. Wow. And then Laura just asked, given the staff turnover uh, in Canada, is there a regular disaster or infection preparedness drills with staff? Maura, I'll let you answer that one. Uh, not in, not in long-term care, acute care, yes. Um, and, and that is one of the things that really caught everybody off guard in long-term care, um, but acute care out in uh, hospitals. And, and so in the beginning, you had uh, been, you identified this facility because they didn't have any COVID infections through all of this. Would you say that, um, I think one of your other slides, the reason why this term, especially considering that 83% of the, uh, the population had um, COVID, would you say that this, this uh, facility was so successful because of the leadership that had had that experience through uh, H1N1 and SARS and had, uh, to your point, I think, prepared ahead of time for yeah. staffing and um, the supply resources or was it just a culmination of everything? What, what do you think kept them COVID free? 
Yeah, I think it was definitely uh, the fact that they'd had previous experience and they were proactive, they were watching. But I think another thing that's unique about Louis Breyer is, uh, well, for one thing, the CEO and the CNO, uh, David Kesselman, he, he is PhD prepared. And uh, he uh, came from Toronto and he decided that he wanted to take this on as a challenge. And so really the turnaround and the quality safety excellence at this facility is because of David. And I think the vision that he has with his leadership team that long-term care has to have the same quality safety standards as acute care. So I have no doubts that he's going to start to put drills and probably do more simulation training with direct care staff after this has happened, because he's always looking at acute care to see what are they doing. And he also um, uh, hired an infection control and a quality safety officer for their leadership team, which is unusual to find in long-term care facilities. And he's a nurse. Yes, David's a nurse. And he's also an emergency nurse. So it's interesting because David came with two other people from Toronto, and they were all had this acute care background. So when they got into Louis Breyer, they immediately said, well, you're not doing a lot of things that you should be doing from a quality safety perspective. So they, they have made a pledge that that's what they're going to do. Wow, what a great, I, I, looking at our Association for Leadership Science and Nursing uh, could almost do something solely on him and his translation of acute care leadership into the long-term care and mm -hmm. the huge impact that it made. You know, I honestly haven't heard of any other um, long-term facilities that had remained COVID-free. Um, they so they quite spectacular, yeah. I think. Yeah, they, they later on had two uh, staff identified with COVID, um, but it, it never went beyond them. They isolated them right away. Wow. But in, in uh, Canada, our definition of an outbreak is even if one person has it. So technically, they've had two outbreaks the whole time, but I mean, they immediately, none of the residents have had it. So uh, it, it was really pretty remarkable. Um, yeah, he's and, and we can share some papers with you. David actually published a paper in our Canadian Journal of Nursing Leadership talking about the work that he did. So we can send some of these papers to you, the ones that Naz and I have done, as well as the one that David did. And so I, Todd was just saying that we need more research uh, and work with leadership development in our long-term uh, care facilities with Rose Sherman doing some of that work. Um, and then Laura said, send us the info, but she also had another question a little further up. Are travelers in long care uh, or are nurses willing to work in an L, uh, long term care facilities as an acute care? Are there uh, do you do you have long travelers and uh, the long term care or is hmm. it only for acute care? Uh, actually, we try, you know, you, you mean traveling nurses, right, yes, yes. that are on contract. And, and because um, Canada is heavily unionized, uh, you, travelers aren't used very much in, in, any, uh, in any environment. They'll have resource pools um, with nurses who maybe want more casual employment. Um, if you work long, if you work full time, part-time, you have full benefits. Uh, and this is just some of the union. Um, and now there's been a real push because of all of this and casual employment causing problems. Um, there probably will be a push from the unions to also say that if you work so many hours as a casual employee, you also get benefits. Wow. Wow. Was it a wonderful presentation? Are there any other questions from the audience? Well, thank you very much, Dr. McPhee and Dr. Hawaii. It's, it was lovely hearing from you. And if I might steal the screen back from you. Yes, well, thank you very much. It's thank been a you. pleasure. Thank you. It was our absolute pleasure.
And then um, just as a reminder for next month on March 9th, we have the ALSN webinar series, Contributing Your Expertise as a Peer Reviewer, Stewarding the Profession. And that's by Dr. Marion Broom. And then um, just a little plug for our conference. It's coming up November 3rd through the 5th in Cleveland, Ohio. Come see us rock it out. Uh, we will have the 2022 International Conference, Leadership in Science Nursing, creating new solutions for new challenges. And as we just heard from our presenters, innovation, innovation, innovation is really the way to help keeping things moving forward. So thank you very much. We really appreciate your time um, and attendance for our our um, participants today, but thank you, Dr. Hawaii and Dr. McPhee. It was a fabulous presentation. Really thank helpful. you. Have a lovely day, everybody. Thank you.